Welcome to the Massachusetts General Hospital Orthopedic Spine Service Preoperative Patient Education class. This is designed for patients undergoing elective spinal surgery. This is an educational class for you and your family to learn a few things about your care during your surgical experience. This class is broken up into three segments what to expect prior to surgery and how to prepare, what to expect while you are in the hospital, and what to expect after you are discharged from the hospital. What to expect prior to surgery. You will have a pre-procedure evaluation phone call appointment where you will speak with a member of the anesthesia nursing team. This takes approximately 20 to 30 minutes and is scheduled about one week prior to surgery. You will review your medical history in detail, including any heart, lung, kidney, musculoskeletal, or neurological conditions as well as if you have had any issues with anesthesia in the past. You will review the medications you are currently taking, including vitamins, supplements, and any over-the-counter medications. It is helpful to have your most up-to-date medication list handy so you do not forget anything. During this phone call, the nurse will instruct you on which medications to continue taking and which medications to stop prior to surgery. Prior to this phone call, you should have completed preoperative blood work to look at your blood counts, including white blood cells, hemoglobin and hematocrit, your chemistries, including sodium, potassium, and glucose, as well as your kidney and liver function, your blood type, and sometimes a nasal swab will be performed looking for colonization of the normal skin bacteria. The nursing team will review your labs with you. Before you finish your preoperative appointment, it is important that you discuss discharge planning. You should talk about where you live, for example, a one or two story home versus an apartment with an elevator, who lives at home with you, and anything that you may need such as a walker, cane, shower chair, or bedside commode to make your post-operative recovery easier. You will also review your advanced care directive or complete one. This is known as a healthcare proxy. This is a person that you will designate to make decisions for you if you are unable to. We encourage all patients to have one. Patients are encouraged to stop smoking prior to surgery for at least six weeks and after surgery for at least six weeks. Smoking does delay healing after surgery. Massachusetts General Hospital is a non-smoking facility. Patients are also encouraged to discuss alcohol use with your physician and anesthesiologist. Alcohol use may affect your hospitalization and post-operative recovery. Alcohol withdrawal can cause unwanted side effects and therefore it is important to be honest regarding alcohol use during this preoperative appointment. Lastly, you will be provided with a pre-surgical wash called chlorhexidine or Hibiclens as well as written discharge instructions regarding how to use this wash. It is important to follow the instructions carefully to help decrease any colonization of normal skin bacteria around the surgical site. Please keep in mind that you should only use this pre-surgical wash before surgery. Please throw this out after surgery as this may delay wound healing. Getting ready for surgery. After surgery, you may have some limitations in terms of range of motion, pain, and generalized fatigue that prevent you from doing your everyday activities easily. One important thing to do before surgery is to make sure your home environment is ready for your return home. 
we do recommend the following. Optimize your home environment. First, remove any throw rugs or anything else that may slip under your feet. Remember, if you will be using a walker or cane after surgery, this will help avoid tripping. It is important to have your home clear of any clutter so it is easier for you to walk around. Second, anything that you use on a daily basis, for example, your favorite coffee mug in a kitchen cabinet or your makeup in a bathroom drawer, you may want to place at waist height. This can be a kitchen counter, bathroom counter, or bedside table. You want to avoid reaching overhead and bending down at the waist. Third, begin to meal plan. You may want to buy frozen meals that you can easily heat or cook a large meal that can be divided into easy to cook individual meals. Next, we are going to discuss packing for your hospital stay. Bring loose, comfortable clothing with you to the hospital. You are encouraged to change into clothing that is comfortable for you. We recommend items such as pants with a drawstring waist or any sweater or robe with an opening in the front. We do recommend loose fitting tops that can easily be pulled over your head. If you are someone who walks better in shoes, we encourage you to bring them. Your feet may be a little swollen after surgery, so make sure that you bring shoes with a little room. For your safety, it is important to bring shoes with a back and a rubber sole. Bring anything that you need to function in your daily life, such as glasses, contacts, hearing aids, or dentures. Please make sure to label everything with your name. Getting ready for surgery continued. We do recommend leaving all valuable items at home. For example, jewelry or excessive amounts of cash. We do recommend bringing a government issue photo ID, such as a driver's license or passport, as well as any debit or credit card. If you wear nail polish on your fingers, please remove this as this interferes with monitoring of your vital signs during your surgery. Another important preoperative measure is to start to add protein and vitamin D to your diet. This promotes wound healing and good bone health. Finally, we recommend identifying a coach prior to surgery. A coach is someone who will be with you throughout your entire surgical experience, from prior to surgery, to your hospital stay, to after surgery. It is helpful to have a second set of ears and eyes during this sometimes stressful process. Your coach can observe your physical therapy sessions, see how to change your dressing, hear your discharge instructions, and provide you with a ride home. What to expect while you are in the hospital. Give surgery. We are now going to talk about your hospital stay. On the day of surgery, you will first check in at the Center for Perioperative Services, which is located on the third floor of the Wang Building. Once you are brought back to the preoperative area, you will meet with the anesthesiologist performing your case as well as your attending surgeon. You will have the opportunity to ask any questions or to discuss any concerns that you may be thinking about. From there, you will be taken to the operating room and you will undergo your spinal surgery. Once your surgery is over, you will be brought to the PACU or the post-anesthesia care unit. While in the PACU, we will make sure that you are awake, your vital signs are stable, and that your pain is controlled enough to be transferred to the post-operative floor. The post-operative floor at Massachusetts General Hospital is the sixth floor in the Ellison and White buildings. Care team. After your spine surgery, you will have a comprehensive team to ensure that you receive the best possible care. This includes your surgical team, the nursing team, the physical therapy team, the occupational therapy team, and the care coordination team. Everyone will work together to make sure that you get where you are going with the things that you will need to ensure a successful recovery. After surgery care. 
When you wake up from surgery, you may notice some lines and tubes around you and your bed, and this is normal. To familiarize yourself, you will have your vital signs monitored, including blood pressure, heart rate, and oxygen saturation. You will have oxygen tubing in your nose to ensure that you are taking nice deep breaths. You will be given an incentive spirometer to encourage deep breathing on your own. You may have IV fluids if necessary. The top photo is a urinary catheter. A urinary catheter will be placed during surgery. In order for the catheter to be removed, the goal is to be out of bed and walking to the bathroom with assistance as needed. You may also have a surgical drain. A surgical drain is similar to a catheter in the sense that it is a piece of plastic tubing that collects fluid. The surgical drain is placed at the site of your incision. This helps to drain excess fluid from surgery that your body may not be able to reabsorb as quickly as we would like. The drain usually gets removed prior to leaving the hospital. Your incision will be checked multiple times a day and the dressing will be changed as needed. The bottom photo is PCDs. After orthopedic surgery, you have an increased risk of blood clots. Pneumatic compression devices, or PCDs, are boots that will help assist with circulation and keeping your blood flowing. Once you are up and walking around, these do get removed. Your care team will also help you with turning and repositioning so that you are able to get in and out of bed safely and comfortably. Again, the goal is to be out of bed walking to the bathroom with assistance if needed. Visualization and activity expectations. Now we will talk about your activity expectations while you are in the hospital. All activity will be progressive and based on your own ability. On the day of surgery, we will try to have you sitting at the edge of the bed and if possible, out of bed with assistance. If you are unable to achieve this, this is not a problem. Again, everything will be based on your own level of tolerance and comfort. Physical therapy will come and work with you on the day after surgery, also known as post-operative day one. They will help you with walking, any equipment needs, and review your precautions. Your precautions include no deep bending, no lifting more than 5 to 10 pounds, and no twisting of your neck or back. These precautions are known as the BLTs and are recommended to be followed until your first post-operative appointment. BLT, bending, lifting, and twisting. No deep bending at the waist, no lifting greater than five to 10 pounds. If you need to pick something up, please always keep your spine neutral and use your knees. Avoid twisting of your waist and avoid twisting of your neck. Rolling. This is an example of a safe way to get in and out of bed. This maneuver is called log rolling. Essentially, you are avoiding putting significant stress on your core and pressure on your lumbar spine by using your arms to get you in and out of bed. If you are lying down in bed on your back and you want to sit up, you will first bend your knees up. Then you will roll to your side with your hip and shoulder, moving at the same time. Next, you will slide your legs off the edge of the bed with your knees bent. Finally, you will push up with your arms and use your legs to counter your weight as you sit up. If you are trying to get back into bed, first, you will sit on the edge of the bed with your buttocks as far back as you can. Then, you will slowly lower yourself down onto your side, using your arms to guide you. Next, once you are lying down on your side, you can bring your legs up onto the bed. 
Finally, roll over onto your back, keeping your knees bent with your hip and shoulder moving at the same time. While you are in the hospital, your physical therapist will help you with log rolling. Before surgery, you may practice this to help facilitate transitions during your hospital stay. Goals after spinal surgery. Now, to recap about your activity goals after spinal surgery. First, we strongly encourage all patients to be out of bed on the day of surgery, sitting up in a chair, or walking to the bathroom with assistance. Most patients will be walking independently about one to two days after surgery and will be walking greater than 100 feet. There is a chance that you may need an assistive device such as a cane or walker to help you with balance and stability. You may go up and down stairs. There are no restrictions on stairs. Everything will be progressive in terms of mobility. Start with short, frequent walks, always on a flat surface, and as you feel better and better, you may increase your time and distance. management. Next, we will talk about your pain expectations while in the hospital. First, it is very normal to have pain after surgery. However, this pain should not stop you from getting up and getting out of bed. You may have heard of the pain assessment scale before. The scale is described as on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the worst pain in your life, how would you rate your pain? We use this scale to gauge how much pain you are having and how we can better control it. Each patient will have an individualized pain management program to best meet their pain requirements. Pain medication is determined on things such as age, weight, past medical history, allergies, and the type of surgery that you are having. body heal. Now we will talk about the healing process. If you are having a lumbar decompression surgery, including a laminectomy or a microdiscectomy, the total healing time typically takes up to 6 to 12 weeks to completely heal. The immediate post-operative period is about 2 to 3 weeks. If you are having a cervical or lumbar spinal fusion surgery, the total healing time may take anywhere from 6 to 12 months to completely heal. The immediate post-operative period is about 2 to 3 months. As you can see, the healing times differ greatly between the two procedures. A fusion surgery has a much longer recovery time. Some things to keep in mind for both procedures is that proper nutrition can help with wound healing and prevent against infections. Please make sure to eat a well-balanced diet, including plenty of protein. Smoking, as discussed earlier, should be stopped prior to surgery as well as after surgery. The reason for this is it can actually inhibit bone growth and therefore interfere with the spinal fusion's healing process. You should avoid smoking for at minimum six weeks after surgery. Other things that can interfere with the spinal fusion process includes anti-inflammatory medication, also known as NSAIDs, such as Motrin, Advil, Aleve, Naproxen, Ibuprofen, and Aspirin. If you are having a spinal fusion surgery, you should avoid NSAIDs for at least six weeks after surgery. If you are having a lumbar decompression surgery, including a laminectomy or microdiscectomy, you should avoid NSAIDs for three days after surgery. Again, it is important to note the time differences between the lumbar decompression surgeries and the spinal fusion surgeries. Discharge process. Next, we will talk about the day of discharge. Typically, we try to discharge patients before 12 noon. If you are having an anterior cervical decompression and fusion, also known as an ACDF, or a lumbar decompression, including a laminectomy or microdiscectomy, you are typically discharged one day after surgery. If you are having a posterior cervical decompression infusion 
for a lumbar spinal fusion, also known as the acronyms PCDF, PLDF, or TLIF, you are typically discharged two to three days after surgery. Your surgeon, as well as your care team, may provide you with either a shorter or longer estimate in regards to your length of hospital stay. These numbers are averages for the different procedures. Before leaving the hospital, your prescriptions for pain medication will be provided to you. The hospital pharmacy is open every day and your medications may be filled prior to leaving the hospital. The pharmacy is located on the first floor of the Wang Ambulatory Care Center on Mass General's main campus. This avoids a stop on the way home from the hospital at your pharmacy to fill your prescriptions. We do require that you bring a government-issued photo ID and a debit or credit card to make this transaction. If you do not choose to participate in the hospital pharmacy, you will receive paper copies of your prescriptions and you may fill your prescriptions at any pharmacy of your choosing. You will also receive a copy of your written discharge instructions that describe your hospital stay as well as your post-operative instructions. These discharge instructions will also specify the date, time, and location of your post-operative appointment. They are a good resource to look back upon if you have any questions. We will discuss your disposition. In other words, where are you going after surgery? There are two places that you may go. The first would be home and the second place would be an inpatient rehabilitation facility, also known as rehab. We strongly recommend that you go home. Your discharge destination depends on a variety of factors. Your physical therapist will assess you at each session and based on how you perform, will determine the safest discharge plan. Typically, most patients should be able to go home after their hospital stay. In order to be cleared by physical therapy, you must demonstrate the following. First, you are able to get in and out of bed safely on your own. Next, you are able to walk a household distance, which is approximately 75 to 100 feet with or without an assistive device, such as a walker or a cane. And lastly, if you have stairs in your home, you must be able to go up and down the stairs safely. If you are able to meet these requirements, then you will most likely be discharged home. You may be recommended for home care services, including nursing and physical therapy. Nursing will check your incision and help you with your medication. Physical therapy will show you simple exercises and assist you with walking. If you do not get cleared to go home, the most likely cause is not meeting physical therapy's requirements or some other medical comorbidity that requires a little more care. This may result in an inpatient rehabilitation stay for about one to two weeks. While at rehab, you will be working very closely with physical therapy for about three hours per day. The location of the rehab facility depends on your insurance, the type of care needed, where you live, and if there are any openings. Care coordination will work closely with you on getting you to where you need to go. What to expect when you are discharged from the hospital. First, we will talk about a collar or a brace. A collar is provided to patients who are undergoing cervical spinal surgery. You should wear this collar at all times as directed by your surgeon and at least until your first postoperative appointment. Recently, we have been straying away from using lumbar braces. However, your team, while at the hospital, will confirm your requirements for wearing a collar or brace after surgery. Now, we will talk about your incision in a little more detail. 
It is important to monitor your incision at least twice a day for any signs of infection. If you are having a posterior cervical surgery, your incision will be on the back of your neck. If you are having a posterior lumbar surgery, your incision will be on the back of your lower back. This makes it difficult to see yourself, and therefore we recommend enlisting your coach or someone that is able to help you look at your incision for you. Things to look out for include drainage from your incision site. Some drainage is normal, so it is best to let your surgeon know immediately so that this can be discussed in more detail. Opening of incisions, temperatures greater than 101.5 degrees Fahrenheit, flu-like symptoms such as chills or body aches, or any increased redness or tenderness around the incision. If you do experience any of these symptoms, please contact your surgeon's office. Typically, when you leave the hospital, your incision will be covered by a thin piece of gauze followed by a thick pad called an ABD pad. These are then covered with a thin piece of plastic, almost like saran wrap, called tegaderm. If you have thin pieces of tape called steri strips over your incision, please leave these in place. These will fall off on their own. You should change your dressing every day once you get home and keep the incision clean and dry. By day five to seven after surgery, your incision should be dry and you may remove your dressing entirely and leave it open to air. If you have staples or sutures in your incision, these will typically be removed at your first postoperative appointment. we will discuss showering. For the first four days after surgery, we request that you keep your incision completely dry and covered. You may shower during this time frame, but your incision must be covered and cannot get wet. You may want to use a waterproof dressing or occlusive dressing to help keep this dry. On post-operative day five, as long as you are not having any drainage from your incision, you may remove your dressing, take a shower, and get your incision wet. Do not stand under the shower so that the water is hitting your incision. Instead, let the water hit the back of your head or the top of your shoulders and then drip down. You may clean your incision with gentle soap and water or sterile saline. Do not scrub your incision, and do not use HibaCleanse, which is the pre-surgical wash on your incision. You may wash your hair normally. When you are done showering, pat your incision nice and dry and leave it open to air. If you would like to put a covering over your incision, we recommend a dry piece of gauze followed by paper tape. This allows some air to circulate over the incision. We do not recommend using band-aids or occlusive dressings at this time to cover your incision as this can trap moisture. Again, we want the incision to dry out. Please do not dry your incision with a hair dryer. Please avoid submerging your incision in water for at least six weeks following surgery. This includes tub baths, swimming pools, and hot tubs or jacuzzis. Please do not use any lotion or creams over your incision. We'll discuss exercise once you are home. Again, walking is the best exercise for you after spinal surgery. You have unlimited walking and stair climbing privileges. You may walk as much as you are physically able to, as long as this is on a flat surface. As you feel better and better, you may increase your time and distance. If you do have access to a treadmill, you may walk on a treadmill if you have someone home with you. Please do not lift anything weighing greater than five to 10 pounds. If you have had cervical spine surgery, please avoid lifting or reaching above your head repetitively. If you have had lumbar spine surgery, Please avoid bending or twisting at the waist. Recently, 
There have been new fitness trends including CrossFit, high intensity exercise programs, yoga, etc. Please do not start an exercise program until you have been cleared by your provider. Next, we will talk about sleeping after surgery. You may sleep in any position which makes you comfortable. We do not recommend sleeping on your stomach. Most patients find comfort sleeping in a reclined position. If you do not have access to a recliner, the bottom photo shows a similar position while lying on your back. You may place a pillow underneath your knees to alleviate pressure from your low back. Another position that keeps your spine neutral is the top photo. If you are more comfortable lying on your side, place a pillow between your knees. It is very normal to have difficulty sleeping after surgery. This may last for a couple of weeks. Normally, your body's natural steroid levels tend to decrease at night. As you are up and walking around and moving during the day, the swelling in and around your nerves diminishes and you typically feel better. As you are trying to lie down and get comfortable at night, coupled with the lower steroid levels, the swelling tends to creep back in and patients end up having more pain at night. The majority of patients find that they do have to get up a few times during the night to walk around, which does help alleviate their pain. Remember, this will improve as time goes on and the healing process continues. We will discuss driving after surgery. When can you drive after surgery? The standard response is you may begin driving after surgery once you are no longer taking any narcotic pain medication or any muscle relaxants as these can make you drowsy. Technically, if you stop your medication two days after surgery, then technically you may begin driving. Other factors include not being restricted by wearing a cervical collar and making sure that you feel completely comfortable with the range of motion of your cervical or lumbar spine. On average, most patients begin driving around three to four weeks after surgery. You may be a passenger in a car as needed. Typically, the most comfortable position when riding in a car is reclined in the front passenger seat or lying down in the back seat. We typically recommend limiting your distances to about 20 to 30 minutes at one time. If you have a commute that will be longer, you should try and stop the car, get out, and walk around to help loosen things up. Next, we will talk about eating after surgery. Important things to remember are to focus on increasing your protein intake to help promote wound healing and prevent against infections. Eating a balanced diet can also help decrease constipation and keep you energized. If you have had cervical spinal surgery through the front of your neck, you may experience some difficulty with swallowing for the first few weeks after surgery. This is not uncommon. Eating softer foods such as yogurt, Milkshakes and mashed potatoes tend to be easier. If you are eating things like meat or bread, please make sure to cut your food into tiny pieces. You may remove your cervical collar to eat. We will discuss constipation. It may take up to seven days after surgery to have a bowel movement. This is probably one of the most common complaints after spinal surgery. Constipation occurs due to undergoing anesthesia, having surgery, decreasing your activity, and taking pain medication. Some things that you can do to help alleviate constipation include drinking plenty of fluids, increasing your fiber, walking as much as possible as this helps stimulate the bowels, and as long as you are taking narcotic pain medication or until you have had more regular bowel movements, you should take both a daily stool softener and a daily laxative. 
The first line for a stool softener is colace, which is over the counter. This comes in capsule form and you may take this up to twice a day. The first line for a laxative is Miralax, which is also over the counter. This comes in powder form that you mix into a beverage such as water and you may use this once a day. If you are getting up to day six or seven without a bowel movement, please contact your surgeon's office as there are other constipation regimens to try. We will talk about pain after spinal surgery. The majority of you are most likely having spinal surgery due to some form of pain. I do like to mention that after surgery, it is not uncommon to still have pain. The most common site is usually in and around your incision. The muscles surrounding your incision also tend to be sore. This is normal and will go away as time goes on. You may use heat or ice over your incision as long as it is not moist heat and the incision does not get wet. Unfortunately, there is another type of pain that can occur after surgery, and this type of pain is something that we call reminder pain. Reminder pain is pain that can be similar to your preoperative pain, or it can be completely different. It may take the form as numbness, tingling, buzzing, or burning. It may be in the same location as prior to surgery, or it may be in a different location. It may even occur on the opposite side. This type of pain is due to the swelling of the nerves after surgery. This type of pain will go away on its own as time goes on. Walking is one of the best remedies for this pain as it helps to decrease the swelling in and around those muscles and nerves. In terms of pain medication, we ask that you please allow your surgeon's office at least two to three days notice prior to running out of medication so that we may refill this in a timely manner. We need you to stay on top of your medication so that you do not get into a scenario where you run out of medication. If you have any questions regarding this, please contact your surgeon's office. As a reminder, if you are having a spinal fusion surgery, please refrain from taking any anti-inflammatory medication, also known as NSAIDs, for at least six weeks after surgery. If you are having a lumbar decompression, including a laminectomy or microdiscectomy, you may resume NSAIDs three days after surgery. You may take Tylenol or extra strength Tylenol as needed. This concludes our preoperative patient education class for the Orthopedic Spine Service at Massachusetts General Hospital. We hope that you feel more informed about what to expect before, during, and after surgery. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to your surgeon's office. Thank you so much for listening and best of luck with your surgery.